I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed. To do His will, my highest Christ, since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear, since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear, since I have been redeemed, since I Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed, where I shall live eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8, looking at verses 5 through 13. Tonight we look at the second part of Samaria, Sorcery, Simon, and Salvation. It's an incredible passage that we have before us. It opens up at least 12 different areas of Bible doctrine. We listed those for you last week. We'll begin reading in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's as far as we got last week. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look at this passage tonight, you might direct our thinking so that we might understand how the sorceries produced by Simon are very much like the sorceries that are going on today in this world. We pray, Father, that as we consider the people who trusted in Christ in Samaria, we might see our own culture 
unfolding before us and the only way to reach them through the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this portion of your word. We pray for your blessings upon it, that you will guide our thinking, guide our understanding, so that we might live holy lives before a wicked world that surrounds us. We pray that you will take your word and apply it to our hearts, personally, individually. And the Father, that you would grant to us the ability to so proclaim Christ before the lost that they will be attracted to him, the only one who can deliver them. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We saw there are at least 12 different things that are covered in this passage here. The composition of the church, the content of the gospel, and the magnificence of grace. The gift of evangelists, the purpose of the spiritual gifts, the spiritual gifts of healing and miracles. Biblical demonology, witchcraft, and the many forms of the occult which are condemned by scripture. God's choice of battlefields in the spiritual warfare. The evident marks of salvation. Chastening and sin in the life of the believer. The kingdom of God and the church and the meaning and proper subjects of baptism. A lot is covered in this passage. We noted last week that the apostles and the remnant were left behind in Jerusalem and Judea. And God now takes the second key deacon, Philip, to Samaria. Stephen, of course, had already been killed in the preceding chapter. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He was the second man chosen after Stephen to serve as a deacon. And we noted that when a person is in leadership, you need to expect to step up to the plate immediately and face the battle when the man ahead of you is taken out of the game. Each one of us has a different time to fight the good fight of faith. And remember that the devil will always try to eliminate the leaders. So be ready when your turn comes. Those of you who uh, remember any of the wars of the past, whether it be World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, they call it a conflict, it was a war, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, know that always, every time, the enemy always shoots at the leaders. And that's why the leaders do not wear their full uniforms when they go into battle with their troops. You and I are marked, if we are leaders, by the devil for elimination. It's one of the principles that he has practiced throughout the spiritual warfare of history in his long war against God. The second thing we noticed was Philip was successful in a different way than Stephen had been successful, although there were similarities. Stephen was an apologist. Philip was an evangelist. Stephen was given the gift of miracles, supernatural powers, but he was killed. Philip performed supernatural miracles, casting out many demons and pr producing many multiple healings, but he was not killed. Stephen faced evil Jewish leaders and false witnesses under the direct control of Satan himself. Philip faced a single evil sorcerer from Samaria and multiple people who were demon-possessed. So we see similarities, but there are differences, too, in the contexts in which we find these men. We looked at the three different words used for Stephen's supernatural gifts for which he was killed. He had power, dunamis. He did wonders, teros, that which causes people to be amazed. And he did miracles, the word being semeon, a sign. The signs were those which deeds which authenticated the message of the messenger. We saw it was used 48 times in the Gospels of the uh, Christ miracles. We saw that it was used to describe the eight messianic signs proving that Jesus is the Messiah in the Gospel of John. There were certain biblical signs listed in the Old Testament which pointed people to Christ and which then, as Jesus had prophesied, would point people to the true gospel of Christ. And that is why Satan imitates miracles. Today we have the finished word of God. We do not have to look for signs. We do not have to look for miracles. God has given us his final authority and his final word. And so today, if it speaks not according to the law and to the testimony, it is because there is no light in them. Very important for us to remember. We saw the temporary nature of the sign gifts during the apostolic period. We saw that the passage in Mark chapter 16 is directly referring to the apostles and to the ap apostolic period, not to those who are snake handlers today in the mountains of Tennessee. 
we saw that the book of Hebrews points out the temporary nature of the miraculous gifts in the opening verses of the book of Hebrews. We saw that the Old Testament miracles parallel some of the New Testament miracles and that miracles and healings are not the same thing. Different words are used and we find that miracles did not produce healings, instead they produced other things. Like plagues, for example, in Moses' ten plagues, uh, when he was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we see miracles in the New Testament, things like striking people with death, Ananias and Sapphira, smiting people with blindness, Elemis the sorcerer, Paul shaking off the poisonous snake into the fire, and so forth. The word for healings was not used of Stephen's miracles. It's used of Philip's miracles, but it's not used of Stephen's miracles. We noted that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about and prophesied the fact that those who came after him would do greater works than those which he had done. And we saw this certainly in terms of the number of miracles that are occurring in the book of Acts and throughout the apostolic period that was certainly true. Then we looked at the message that Stephen preached. He preached Christ unto them and we saw the history of Samaria. We saw God moving in a special way with his grace into a group of people that had been marked ever since 722 BC as outcasts because they had intermarried with Gentiles. And we took it all the way through the Old Testament period, the, the founding of the city of Samaria. We talked about the curse that occurred in the days of Ahab, the son of Omri who founded Samaria. We saw that they had the golden calves in Bethel and Dan, the multiple pagan worship that had been brought in by the, the foreigners that first Sennacherib and late, then later Sargon and Ashurbanipal had brought into the land in the three different transportations that the Assyrians had made, bringing pagan nations into the land of Israel, the northern tribes. And yet God reached down in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ and drew a Samaritan woman and many Samaritans to himself. And in the days of the apostles, God reached down and took an evangelist by the name of Philip to the Samaritans. And many of them trusted in Christ. But we saw the fluctuation in the battle because by the fourth century AD, the Samaritans had become some of the most staunch adversaries of Christianity. Yet they have one little window in history where God reached down into their midst and drew people to Christ. The grace of God. How thankful we can be that God has reached down and drawn us to Christ, for we are much like the Samaritans. We talked about that in great detail last week. And so tonight we move past that point. The message they heard was Christ. We saw the evangelization that took place was not merely a pep talk. We saw that the evangelization that took place was systematic Bible exposition, which is always the foundation for evangelism. Not only Galizo is used to speak of Philip's preaching, but Peruxon, preaching, expounding the word. And both of those words are used in the context of Philip. He was explaining the scriptures to them and God took the scriptures and used the scriptures to draw people to Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is the scriptures that point to Christ. All of the scriptures reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he preached the scriptures to them and thus preached Christ to them. Now we move to the second part. In verses 6 and 7, the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, they can use a person's vocal cords to express themselves, came out of many that were possessed with them and had been taken, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Here in verse 6, 
we find that the word translated miracles, seeing the miracles which he did, is that same word, semeon, which is the word for signs. The purpose of the miracles that Philip performed was to point to the truth of the message that he proclaimed. It was not merely to make people impressed. Many involved in the charismatic movement today are doing this to make people impressed with how great the person doing the miracles are. These were signs pointing to the message. The people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake as a result of hearing and seeing the miracles. They believed the message because it was authenticated by the signs that God gave. It's interesting that Simon the magician missed that point when he tried to purchase divine power a little bit later on uh, in this passage here. You see, Simon wanted to aggrandize himself. Simon didn't understand that the miracles were not so that Philip could have power, so that the apostles later could have power. The miracles were to point to Christ. And he had just lost a lot of power. He had just lost a lot of authority. He had just lost a lot of control and the money that came with it. He missed the point that these things were signs to point people to Christ. Now it's interesting as we look at this part of the text, because we need to ask ourselves the question, what kind of demonic activity and demon possession faced Philip at the Samaritan revival? It says, for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. Notice the fact that this crowd to whom Philip preached contained many demon-possessed people. In other words, this was not a rare thing then. And when we begin to look at what unclean spirits are, it's not a rare thing now based on the type of demons that possessed these people. A number of weeks ago, I was speaking with a person who was talking about training children and how during their devotion times, they'd come across a passage in the Gospels uh, which talked about demon possession. And the children in that group uh, said, well, what about demons? Are there demons today? And this particular person said, well, I really don't know. They'd been raised in a Bible-believing, Reformed church and had never heard any preaching about demonic activity. It has sort of been glossed over. People, the demons don't die when they get to be 90 years old and then go to hell. The demons are spirit beings who used to be part of that group of holy angels that worshipped God, but when Satan rebelled, a third of them followed him, and instead of being holy angels, they are now unholy angels. And ever since the fall of Satan, they have sought with Satan to seduce men and women and boys and girls into wicked activity and when possible, to actually enter into people and possess them, control them, so that they do Satan's bidding and not God's bidding. This is serious material that we're talking about here. Satan and the demons are alive and well in the world today, and they have at least 6,000 years of experience in working on people in how to best manipulate people. Which kind of people are most subject to their influence? Now a Christian cannot be demon-possessed because you have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. Demon possession deals with a demonic spirit entering inside the body of a human being and controlling them, entering into his spirit, controlling his spirit and his soul and his body in such a way that he does that which is evil. It may appear okay on the surface, but it actually has a nefarious purpose that Satan is in charge of to move that person in certain circles to accomplish Satan's goals in the war against God. 
That is very serious business. There are no more demons today than there were at the time of Christ, but there are no less demons today than there were at the time of Christ. Demons are not only in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria, but they are in the uttermost parts of the earth, for they continue to do battle with the people of God who are carrying the gospel of Christ. So what we're looking at here is something very significant. How many angels are there? We don't know. So we don't know what a third of the angels are. But there are demonic spirits, fallen angels, all over the earth today. And they're not busy just running around and doing nothing in the middle of the jungles. They are looking for people whom they can control because you see mankind is the object of God's love. And so to try to damage the object of God's love, demonic forces are busy destroying the object of God's love. It is a spiritual warfare. And so what we're talking about here as we move into the subject of biblical demonology is very significant because it was many who were demon-possessed at Samaria. It was not a rare thing. We're going to look at the kind of demons that are revealed here in this particular passage because there are many different kinds. They do different things. Just like there are different echelons of holy angels, there are different echelons of demonic forces. And Paul explains that using four different words in Ephesians. We'll not talk about that just yet. Notice here it says the demons are called unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. That's the word a kathartos. Ah, the negative. Kathartos, the word for clean, they are ah, kathartos. We get our word catharsis or cathartic, that which cleanses from this word without the negative prefix. A catharsis is the root form of the word. It's used in the New Testament most frequently of lewdness and moral impurity motivated by demonic forces. The most frequent use of this word is for lewdness and moral impurity motivated by demonic forces. For example, in Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to give you a multiple series of passages here, just summarizing them briefly, but I want you to see how often it is used in the New Testament to describe this unclean, lewd, morally impure, demonic activity. For example, in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, it's used of sodomy and lesbianism. Starting in verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. That's our word there, akathartos through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. That is the uncleanness to which God gave them up. Sodomy and lesbianism. Do we see that on the increase here in the United States? Do we see the push for laws which will make it illegal for you even to preach against sodomy and lesbianism, which if you say anything negative about it will be considered a hate crime. People, it's not merely the flesh that's behind the movement towards sodomy and lesbianism in the United States and elsewhere in the world. It is demonic forces that are pushing this. In Romans chapter 6 it is used of habitual immorality. Romans 6.19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, 
For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, that is repeated moral sin, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. It is set in distinct contrast to habitual immorality. In 2 Corinthians, it is used of fornication and shameless nudity. Chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, but that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, now listen to the next phrase, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Uncleanness, fornication, and lasciviousness bundled together here. Lasciviousness, aselgia, and we're going to see that occurring multiple times in connection with uncleanness. Aselgia means shameless immorality. Brazen nudity. People who flaunt the exposure of the body. In Galatians 5, it's listed with adultery, fornication, and lasciviousness in the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Interesting, it's connected not only with adultery and fornication and lasciviousness, but it's also connected with idolatry and witchcraft. And as you know, throughout the world, much idol worship is connected with sexual immorality. It was back in the days of the Old Testament. It was in the days of the New Testament. It has historically been where there is idolatry, there is the connection with sexual immorality. That's true today. Wherever there is idolatry, it's connected in the pagan temples with immorality. For example, you go to India, and all of the pagan temples there have ritual prostitutes, and many of them use even tiny children in those horrifying rituals. Satan always moves people when involved in idolatry into immorality. We find it is also listed that way with adultery and fornication in Ephesians chapter 4. It's portrayed there as brainless, unfeeling, greedy, passionate immorality. And truly brainless. I mean, listen to what he says. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. That means empty-minded. The emptiness of their minds, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now verse 19. Who being past feeling, their conscience is no longer pricked. They have seared their conscience. Peter tells us about the searing of the conscience. The scar tissue doesn't have any nerve endings in it anymore to feel who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. They have actually turned themselves over to lasciviousness. That shameless exposure of the human body. Grotesque immorality. To work all uncleanness. That's our word. To work all uncleanness with greediness. It's brainless, unfeeling, greedy, passionate immorality. Notice something else. Greed and covetousness are often tied to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible. Greediness and covetousness, let me say it again, greediness and covetousness are often tied to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible. Covetousness Paul says, Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5, covetousness is 
Do you know? Idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. You begin to see the connection? Be very careful if you allow covetousness to grow in your life because it leads toward all forms of immorality. Covetousness is idolatry. The idolater is a covetous man. Be careful. They're tied to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible because there is money to be made, it's called filthy lucre, with nudity and immorality. Pornography is one of the largest grossing non-taxed businesses in the world today. I read a very interesting article recently talking about the gross income, estimated gross income, of pornography worldwide because of the spread of internet pornography and the huge number of websites that sell that stuff to people. Why is it so popular? Because there is money to be made in it. People with greed in their hearts are defiling men and women all over the world, not only those who have participated in making that trash, but those who are now sucked into that trash. It's not merely the flesh that's involved in this, folks. It is demonic forces that are behind it. That is why it is so dangerous even to get close to it. It's not just the lust of the flesh. It's controlled by demonic forces defiling people on what I would call a mega level because they know that mankind is the object of God's love and the object of God's plan of redemption. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 11, it's classified with fornication, covetousness, idolatry, obscenity, and whoremongers. Beginning in verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. In other words, Christians can fall into this sin of uncleanness as well. It's wedged between fornication and covetousness in verse 3. Neither filthiness, that's iskrotes, which means shamefulness or obscenity, nor foolish talking, obscenity is listed with foolish talking and foolish jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks, that's what should come out of our mouths. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, there we have our word again, akathartos, nor covetous man, listed here between whoremongers and covetous people, is the unclean person who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. These are things that call down the wrath of God upon those who disobey the word of God. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And those of you who have been with us for a long time know that the word there translated partakers is a word that deals with fellowship. You've got to be very, very careful because dirt rubs off. Ephesians 5.11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Christians must not only be careful to avoid contamination themselves, but we have a responsibility when we find this, especially among those who call themselves Christians, to reprove them of their wickedness, uncleanness. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Again, we find that same context. 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, that's evil desires, desires for forbidden things, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now, ye, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, ascaralogia, vile, shameful, immoral conversation, swearing, minstos, things like that are being talked about in verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 2.3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8, the description of moral sin called uncleanness and contrasted here with holiness. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, which is epithumia, which is literally upon hot passion, if you broke the word down, upon hot passion, a lust for that which is a clearly passionate morality, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Very interesting if we had time to do a study on the word defraud there. That's what Paul uses uh, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now verse 7. Here's his summary. For, because, in other words, based on all of what I've just said, God hath not called us unto uncleanness. All of that wicked immorality that he's just been talking about with multiple different words is tied up in that big ball of wax called uncleanness. God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Holiness is the opposite of uncleanness. And then look at verse 8 and think about it well in this context. He therefore that despiseth, you make light of what God says on this subject, you despise what God says on this subject, despises not man but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. That's why the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, that they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Shall we take our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and join it to an harlot? For the two in the marriage relationship are made one. Do you not realize this also occurs when you commit fornication, when you commit adultery? Very serious issues to take the temple of God and make it unclean. He that despises, despises not man, but God, who has given to us his Holy Spirit. In Second Peter, uncleanness, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, is one of the main character markers of the apostates. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous they are, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Uh, those of you who have been with us as we looked at the marks of apostasy in the morning worship services, comparing the false teachers with godly teachers, Jude gives us 18 marks of an apostate, Peter gives us 20 marks of an apostate, and they both include uncleanness in that list. We find that in Revelation chapter 16, unclean spirits can work miracles and they're going to control the world during the tribulation. God's power to work miracles is far greater than Satan's power and so he overcame the unclean spirits as Philip preached the word. Jesus cast out many unclean spirits. They came out crying with loud voices. But during the tribulation, we discover that unclean spirits work miracles and control the world. Revelation 16. 
And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Rather interesting the description that he gives to us of their appearance if they can be visibly seen. Three unclean spirits like frogs. Did you know that in many cultures, and you can see this if you look at, for example, the stone carvings in Mexico from the ancient Aztecs and others, they are often portrayed either as serpents or as frogs, these demon gods that they worshipped. That's true in many other cultures around the world. They are portrayed as frogs. Some people like little statues of frogs and set them around their house. I don't think I'd want a statue of a frog. After I discovered that is one of the ways in which demons, when they are visible and appear, appear. Unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The demonic spirits that reside in those three most evil of all are unclean spirits. Unclean spirits in Revelation 18 will be confined to the fallen Babylon during the tribulation. Beginning in verse 1, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The foul and unclean and hateful driven to Babylon. Okay, so why am I making such a point of the sin of uncleanness? First of all, because most people have no idea what it is. They simply don't. They have no idea what it is. Second, as you can see, it is condemned repeatedly in Scripture. Third, if the Bible talks about it repeatedly, God is making a point that he wants us to stay far away from it. And fourth, because it is so closely connected with demonic activity, controlling the flesh. This same demonically motivated sexual impurity is seen repeatedly in the Gospels where Christ casts out unclean demons. For example, the nudist Gadarene demoniac who wore no clothing. Luke chapter 8, verse 27. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Second thing we learn here, though this is not always the case, yet it is certainly many times the case, this was a homeless person. He wore no clothes, he abode in the tombs. He was an unclean man with an unclean spirit. I don't have time to talk about all the different homeless types that I've come in contact with and tried to work with over the years. And we've done much of that. Even when in Birmingham and working at the Christian Service Mission, often coming in contact with people like this, and you would sense the presence of evil. Nudism is a manifestation of aselgia, lasciviousness. We mentioned that a moment ago. Uninhibited shamelessness, a mark of demonism. The reason I say all of this is because this has crept into the church, particularly in girls' and women's clothing styles, but also in the body decorations and the body revealing clothing of boys and men. A Christian should always be aware of this dangerous trend and stay as far away from it as possible. You remember when I was preaching on the tabernacle? 
we talked about holy clothing worn by the priests when ministering before the Lord. We saw that the Bible very clearly tells us that we are a kingdom of priests today as we minister before the Lord in our daily activities in front of an unsaved world. It doesn't just apply to the clergy or the men of the cloth. We are all part of that kingdom of priests ministering before the Lord in the face of an unseen or unsaved world that watches our every movement. We have an obligation to show visibly a difference between the sacred and the profane. We have an obligation not to cause weaker brothers and sisters to stumble in their Christian walk. We have an obligation not to bring shame and reproach to the name of Christ, whose name we bear. Take notice of the gathering demoniac after he was saved in verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were astounded to see somebody whom they had always known as naked, suddenly clothed, not ranting and raving, but sitting at the feet of Jesus. The world is astounded when they see those who have not only trusted Christ, but who manifest it in a visible way. They were afraid, it says. Do they trust Christ? No. Because they realize they've just lost a lot of money. 2,000 pigs off a cliff into the ocean. And they didn't have any refrigeration trucks to freeze them with. And so they begged him to depart out of their coasts. To them, 2,000 pigs was worth more than the soul of of a man for eternity. You know, the world is like that. 2,000 pigs are worth more than a human soul. Covetousness, idolatry, immorality, lasciviousness, uncleanness. People, we live in a world that Satan is trying to control not only at the governmental level, but through many of our friends and neighbors that surround us. And if you have fallen into this trap, he is trying to control you through this trap as well. He can't possess you, but he can influence you with the lusts of the flesh. It is deadly and it will destroy you. God himself, when you defile his temple, which is your body, will destroy you. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians. It is a dangerous sin, the sin of uncleanness. Unclean, demon-possessed people also show up in religious settings. In the time of Christ, we see them showing up in the synagogue, they show up in churches today, too. Mark chapter 1, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Thou Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Somebody who was a regular attender at synagogue was possessed with an unclean spirit. Do you think 
the devil, doesn't send people with unclean spirits into churches today because he's got the synagogue. Twice in the book of Revelation it talks about the synagogue of Satan. Oh, he's got the synagogue. You think that he's content not to send his people with unclean spirits into churches, or what at least on the outside call themselves churches. Do you understand what's going on just three or four blocks from us here in the building where this church used to meet with conferences for homosexuality and other unclean and wicked demonic things? Do you understand what is going on in the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches? But Satan doesn't just confine himself to apostates. He sends his people, and I've run across some of them, in churches over nearly 40 years of ministry. They are there. And they come in with the purpose of defiling and thus destroying the church. The type of demon possession with unclean spirits can happen even to young children. It may come through different means, possibly through exposure to immoral activities by the parents or by siblings or by others or through sexual abuse or through the occult. Many have gotten involved in it as a result of the occult, or as a result of pornography that they've seen. It's a strong warning to parents to protect your little children and to stay away from those things as well. Because parents who think they can handle it are often the stupid doorway that opens children to evil. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 25. For a certain woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit. Skip one word. Whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, but the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon a bed. What kind of a demon was it? It was an unclean spirit. Her young daughter had an unclean spirit. Matthew 17, another illustration. And when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And that Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. You say, well, I didn't see the word unclean. I didn't see how old the boy was there. Well, Mark gives us the parallel account. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought thee my son which, has, son which has a dumb spirit, and wheresoever it taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his child, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. Now there are a number of different words, words for children in the New Testament. This is paideon. Not just pais, paideon. A little child. It's a word used for infants. It's the same word that Herod used when telling the wise men to search diligently for the child. It's used of Jesus when the wise men found him with Mary. It's used in Matthew 8, 2 and 4 where the little child sat on Jesus' knee 
And Jesus used that little child as an example of humility. And oftentimes it hath cast him, this little child, into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, that is the unclean spirit, the akathartos spirit, that's the word that's used here, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, you see, he can control the vocal cords. He can control the hearing. These unclean spirits, even as they scream when coming out of a person. I charge thee, come out of him and enter into him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. And when he was come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? Even the apostles, who had been given supernatural power over demonic forces, could not cast out this kind of a demon. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. When we're talking about unclean spirits, we're not talking about low-order demonic forces. We're not talking about the privates in the army. We're talking about very powerful spirits and they are the ones who are behind and motivate this thrust that we see in the United States today of all this immense immorality in every form there are a lot of other things that we can learn from those passages about the nature and tactics of demonic forces but my purpose tonight is just to point out what was happening with Philip and the Samaritan Revival. This was immense power by the Spirit of God with healings and miracles, gifts that are no longer available today, that God gave to Philip, which he was exercising through the preaching of the Word of God in Samaria as the demonic forces were being driven out of these people, many possessed with unclean spirits. Now I can't see the clock clearly in the back, but I think that it's about 7.20, am I correct? Okay, well we're going to have to close that down. That'll, next week we'll talk about differences, contrasting uncleanness in the Old Testament with uncleanness as it relates to immorality. But the Lord willing, that's where we'll pick up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we have dealt with some very serious issues tonight that most of the time we simply pass off. We read over the word uncleanness and it means nothing to us and yet we see it over and over and over and over again in the New Testament connected to demonic activity in relation to immorality and what foul and wicked sins it covers. Father, we pray that you will, by your grace, help us to understand this horrifying danger and never to allow Satan to use the lusts of the flesh to tempt us in that direction. Cause us always to be on guard, to be constantly wearing the spiritual armor that you have provided in Ephesians 6 and constantly exercising the use of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to fight away those demonic forces which would seek to influence us in any way. Cause us to understand that you have called us not to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Help us to remember how this affects the covering of the human body and how we as believers have a responsibility to avoid following the ways of the world. Again, Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that tonight you will take it and use it in our hearts 
so that we might have a deeper understanding of the spiritual warfare in which we are involved and which we see transpiring here in the passage that we've studied tonight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.